In this week, we're going to cover a fairly short module. Um, this is almost like a bye week in a way. It's mainly going to be just a discussion board and this lecture and a few other provided resources. Um, the main idea here is to discuss competency-based training. Training is a continuous conversation and issue when it comes to um, pretty much every industry. Um, but I believe that the healthcare industry, again, as we've discovered and talked about in many of these modules, has a lot of additional considerations when it comes to training um, for a number of reasons that we'll go over during this session. But I mentioned it below here in the tagline, not just for clinicians, because the, the, the term competency-based is often associated uh, with clinical staff. And it's actually mentioned very specifically in standardization language, particularly with the Joint Commission. And we're going to talk about it a little bit, um, you know, but, but and from the nursing perspective and the clinician perspective, it seems that there's almost sometimes a disconnect between competency-based training for clinicians and um, particularly nursing staff and stuff. And then training for the other staff, really support staff particularly. And, and I have seen this over the years where it's almost like we, we really travel two different paths and we really don't seem to understand. Um, I don't understand why, because I believe uh, competency-based training is for everyone um, in what we're gonna talk about complex environments. So, you know, I know if you, again, if you look at the standards and you look at leadership standards and HR standards, you're gonna see the term competency consistently. And if you know somebody who works as a nurse or a nursing, they're gonna understand competency. Um, but what I'd like to do is sort of expound on it and give it a little bit more of a facilities perspective um, and really kind of take, you know, what I'm gonna talk about, I, I listen to several different sessions and I, I listen to a couple seminars and webinars. And um, while I didn't disagree with the webinars, it felt like that they sort of weren't very nuts and bolts about it, that they were much more kind of ideology when it comes to competency based. And what I'd like to do is, is to give a few tools and, and bring it down to a little more nuts and bolts as far as, you know, what is it, why is it, and uh, some of the key elements of competency based training and some of my experiences. So again, um, you know, it's something that I've applied over the years. Uh, I've had had pretty good luck with it um, in terms of when it's when um, applying some of these tools. And I know it's something that you all can build on um, in your um, professions and as facility managers and leaders. So let's get going on the session of competency based training, not just for clinicians. First thing is I want to talk about is the uh, is what is competency based training? Here. Well, in short, it is being very intentional on ensuring staff have the skills, training, tools to do the job and develop. And there's a lot that's said in that. I mean, um, you know, being, being intentional is really, I think, one of the biggest pieces to it. To, in my opinion, you know, probably almost any training tool will work if you're intentional, if you understand your audience, if you understand the material, if you understand your objectives, and then you put together something to achieve, you know, your goals and objectives, it'll work, it, it, it'll work. Um, and that's key, just being intentional versus just getting it done. And I think that's probably one of the things that you see an awful lot as an issue is that people just want to get it done. You know, they look at training as something we have to do. And I think there's a reason for it because I think the reason why is because some of the training we do is not very valuable. It's sort of regulatory, it's required, it's repetitive. And it really doesn't take the individual in mind at all. It's just something that has to be checked off. So a lot of training we do is, is sort of repetitive. And so we're not very intentional about it. We just say, hey, get this done. I've, I've seen some really awful examples of people just saying, hey, here's a piece of paper, sign off everything you know. And people check it off and then sign off at the bottom and say, okay, well, there's your competencies. And you've signed off on them. And it's kind of scary. And again, I have seen that over the years. Um, and, and people still do that to some degree. Um, but really, that's not what we're wanting to do. We want to be intentional. And again, we want to make sure that the staff, they have the skills and the training of the tools. Can't say enough about skills and, and, and tools. We talked about training already here a little bit. We'll talk about it some more. But, you know, we got to identify the skills our staff need, you know, that are required for the position. And then we have to really give them the tools to do it. Um, too many times we don't give them the right tools and it's just that much harder to get the job done or to uh, accomplish the tasks that we're asking them to do. Uh, often a tool is what helps get the job done. It actually makes it possible. 
But when it comes to constant-based trading, there, there are several some terms here. For example, core competencies. You know, core competencies, these are the things that in order to even do the job, you have to have these skill sets. You know, for example, you know, if you had an HVAC technician, uh, you would say, well, a core competency of an HVAC technician is he has to understand maybe refrigeration or he needs to understand filters or air handlers um, or pumps or fans or motors. I mean, they have to have these understandings, uh, maybe calculations of CHFM, things like that. Uh, you would think would be a core competency. You might even say, you know, building automation systems is a core competency for an HVAC person. You know, for an electrician, you would have very specific core competencies. You know, understanding obviously electrical safety would be a core competency. You know, lockout tagout would be a core competency uh, for an electrician. Um, obviously, understanding how to use very specific meters would be core competencies. Um, understanding fusing and breakers and things like that would, would be core competencies. You know, wire sizes, gauges, you know, and maybe certain codes, NFPA 70. So you would have core competencies for these positions. Um, and then you have what's called general competencies. General competencies are things that pretty much everyone has to know. Um, fire safety is kind of a general competency. Everyone in an organization has to have fire safety. You know, I mentioned electrical safety and lockout tagout. Well, electrical safety is another general competency that many people need to have. They all have to have some knowledge of, you know, of safety when it comes to that. Um, other competencies, you know, might be, mm, you might, you might even treat, um, you know, infection prevention as a general competency or possibly a core competency. And sometimes there's a little bit of a blurring of lines between general competencies and core competencies. One other thing about these competencies is there is a very important thing to understand about competencies when it comes to when someone does something regularly and all the time, if you will, to maintain their competency. In other words, it, it's part of their daily job. Then when it comes to selecting what to train people on, very often you don't have to retrain people on something they do all the time. Um, it makes sense, right? Well, it's, it makes sense, but that's not the way it's done an awful lot. Lots of times, you know, we'll take people through something that they do all the time and we'll sit there and say, you know, we need to, you know, test you and show that you can do it. Um, where you as you can demonstrate through work orders and projects that they, they, they know how to do that job. Um, in my opinion, when it comes to training on core and general competencies, you really want to build on things where there's maybe a deficit in a skill because it's done once in a great while. Um, for example, you know, you may want to, um, you know, emergency manual transfer and load shed for generators. That's a classic. It is such a rare thing to have to actually do that. You know, you're in a situation where your generator is getting overloaded or maybe it's limping along or maybe uh, you have some issue within your building that's causing you to have to shed certain parts of your building to sustain and maintain and protect your generator. And so you have to do a load shed. Well, some of these load sheds are manual. And because we do it so rarely, um, that would be one of those things where it's a competency. You want to know that your staff are competent to do it, but you're going to want to test them on that with some regularity. Why? Because if they don't test them on it and you don't do it, then, then when the time comes, they're just simply not going to be able to do it or they're not going to have the confidence to do it. Or if they do do it, they're likely to do it wrong. And so, you know, so when you look at competencies, you have to look at the ones that they do every day and you look at competencies that they do infrequently. And you really got to test and train to the ones that are done infrequently. And then also you have to be very, very mindful of new competencies. When, when new uh, technologies or new complexities come into your organization and you got to integrate new competencies in. And that, we're going to talk about that a little bit more as well. Tied to performance. And this is kind of going back to the discussion about what people do on a regular basis and what people do once in a while. Um, when it comes to job descriptions and core competencies, you want to know that things that they do all the time and things that they do maybe once in a while, that they're maintaining a level of skill on it. And you want to tie it to performance. Um, and there are ways to do that. And we've talked about in previous classes about SMART goals. This is an area to create SMART goals. You know, you want to be specific and measurable. You know, you want it to be, in this case, assignable. Uh, realistic and time bound. You want to make sure that they are able to do certain things in a certain amount of time very specifically that you can measure and demonstrate a competency. 
Um, so when it comes to tied performance, when you when you and this is a great way, it's 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 a great way to uh, be able to build confidence and build and really build a team. And we'll talk about that again in a little bit as well. Non-punitive is so important, and we'll address this later too. That your competencies-based um, training is non-punitive. Now, don't get me wrong. There, there, there. It is important, and it really leads to the next thing here. Um, but before I get to that, that that when it comes to training, you want to create a culture, if you will, that it, that your culture is non-punitive. That you are there to learn and to grow. And we're going to talk about again more of this in a moment. I got grow in, grow up, and grow out. You know, competencies are a way to really develop your talent. And what you want to do is, in some cases, you want to grow your talent in. In other words, you want to establish talent. You want to have staff and personnel that can, in many cases, back each other up or prepare for somebody retiring or prepare for maybe downsizing and staff realignment, things like that, which are all things that happen. And so you want to be able to grow people in. You know, you got to be able to have, okay, you were doing this and now you're going to do this. And again, going back to, to, to job performances, you want to be able to then make those modifications on the job performances. One of the things I did every single year on job performances is ask, this, is ask the, the, and, and discuss, what are you doing new this year that you weren't doing last year? Or maybe what are you not doing anymore? Because that happens too and actually change the job descriptions to reflect it if it was a, a fairly significant change. And that often, and over, over years, that person would then evolve into a whole new role or a whole new job title. And I've had that happen several times where people started off as, I had one person that started off as a painter and ended up as a telecommunications person because they just start doing more and more phone work and more and more telecommunications work and more systems work. And next thing you know, 40% of the time was spent working telecom and they became a telecommunications person, which did associate itself with, you know, increase in pay. So, you know, people evolve. And so when you grow them in, which actually leads to growing up, um, you know, growing up is, is, is what I was getting to related to when they, when you look at the review every year, you know, as they gain new skill sets, as folks gain new skill sets, you know, you're going to end up growing them up in the organization. They're going to take on more responsibility. Uh, very often, they're going to become lead technicians or they're going to become senior maintenance people or they're going to become managers or supervisors uh, within your organization, And with, which really leads to the next thing or grow them out. And really, this is two things. This is, this is both grow them out. In other words, you, you're going to have folks that are going to have aspirations. Matter of fact, many of you are in this situation. You have aspirations to become managers of your own facilities, directors of your own facilities. Uh, regional directors, whatever, executive directors, uh, managers, whatever. And, and what's going to happen is you're going to grow your competencies. You're going to grow up within the organization. And then it's going to be time for you to grow out. Or you're going to have staff that are going to grow out. And as managers and as directors, you're going to, you don't be afraid of this. I think there is a tendency to say, hey, look, I've taken this all these years to groom you and train you and, and do all this stuff. And, and now you can't leave. And it is scary to lose talent like that. But here's, here's, here's the thing. If you're doing it right, if you're doing a really good competency-based training and you're applying it to all your staff, then you, have, you should have several people that can fill some of these gaps. Um, and I understand things are lean out there and, and, you know, and, and losing anybody is a hardship. But it's even more of a hardship when all your energy and all your resources and all your training has gone into one individual and that individual decides to leave. You know, you really should want it to where you have a lot of people who have a lot of good skill sets. You will, I mean, you will have some people that won't grow their skill sets. They'll stay a general maintenance person. And they'll be happy being a general maintenance person, you know, and not advancing their skill sets or the job description. But by and large, people are going to grow over time and you want that to happen. And then they end up sometimes, again, growing up or growing out. Growing out also means, and it sounds strange to say it this way, but growing out also means terminating people. Um, really many times what you find through the competency process is that there's just not a fit. Um, sometimes there's not a fit because the organization, um, you know, uh, the, the, the individual hasn't developed the skill sets to do the job. And it's through the competencies they demonstrate that they don't have the skill set. They just either don't have the talent, uh, academic or intellectual or motivation or, or otherwise to do the job. Often it's related to other things in terms of poor performance, like attitude or attendance or things like that. But um, 
or maybe even in some cases it might even be in subordination and things where they just don't want to take on new jobs and they're actually actively or passively working against um, you know change and so in those cases I say grow out and when I say grow out because for me the ideal of someone leaving an organization should not be the death knell of like well, okay well you know they, 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 they quote failed here to do the job it should be no maybe the fit wasn't right here but maybe they're meant to do something else to grow them to another place and I think that's one of the goals I've tried to do when I have people that aren't developing and you know they're not going to be a good fit you try to find a place for them to go you try to grow them into what they're good at because in doing the whole competency based training exercise you end up finding out an awful lot about people about their strengths and their weaknesses and you can sit there and say you know what maybe this person doesn't fit well in facilities and maintenance or engineering or security or whatever it is but maybe they would fit perfectly in another area or really in another job arena or industry and there's nothing wrong with that but how you go through that process I think can be is very critical and competency based training is a mechanism and a tool to do that so so that you know, that's what competency based training is it's it's growing your people it's it's non punitive it's related core and general competencies and really again the short of it is it's giving people the right skills training and tools to do the job and develop so why competency based well competency base is critical in healthcare and many industries for for these reasons one complexity and that we've gone over that too many times so I'm not going to go over it anymore it's a complex environment dynamic changes um, again we talked about that a little bit previously we go through changes we lose staff we realign staff we lose equipment we get contracts we uh, go through financial crisis all kinds of things and if you don't have competency based training then you're not going to you're going to have big gaps immediately and you're going to be in crisis immediately so dynamic changes in our industry is going through a lot of dynamic changes you know for example we know we're acquiring more outpatient buildings anymore you know we're, we're downsizing some facilities expanding other facilities you know we're into projects things like that you know you want to be able to delegate so you need to have folks that are developing for all these dynamic changes that can fill in these gaps generational workforce you know we have people who approach work differently and you, you, you've seen it, you know, we talk about the X Gen and the Y Gen and even the baby boomers and, you know, the millennials and, you know, we have all these different generations and work. And competency based trading sort of ties them together. In other words, while we may differ on how we approach work, doing the job and getting it done in a competent way doesn't really change but so much. I mean, you know, it's very kind of task driven. You know, in order to do certain work, by and large, there's a certain way to get it done. Now, granted, you need to give a certain amount of latitude and creativity to get a job done in, in a flexible way, in a safe way. But at the same time, the core training should remain pretty constant. And it sort of brings people into that same box. And in some cases, it can be a way to cross pollinate, if you will, between these generations. You know, letting younger folk teach older folk things. You know, maybe it has to do with computer technology or things like that. Or maybe having some of the older staff work with the younger staff when it comes to some of the more, you know, technical details of dealing with, you know, hospital systems. So, you know, so so really it's it's competency based training is a way to cross pollinate and bring generations together. It's also a retention tool. You know, staff and people, we all love to be trained and, and know that we're in a company that is invested in us and investing in us. And when you do training, it's an investment. And that really leads to retention. When people feel like, hey, they're giving me the latitude to train or they're going to give me some school t skills or allow them to grow me up and grow my skill sets, that's very often an excellent retention tool. Um, you know, safety, no doubt about it. I mean, you, you want to know that after hours when, that, when whoever's on call, that they get that call in the middle of the night about the building being without power or whatever is going on or without water um, or without cooling or whatever it is, that the person going in there has the abilities to maintain the safety of the environment <clears throat> and knows what to do and how to respond and react. This is not saying that they need to have every skill set of everybody else, but it's saying that if they don't have the skill set, they recognize it, they know who to call and know how to respond. Technology changes. Again, we kind of talked about this a little bit when it comes to complexity and dynamic changes, but technology changes, when they come into your facility, you have to embrace them many times and you have to go through a competency-based process of developing folks. Um, you know, that's, that's one of those things where, 
you know, very often you may, you may take a person who seems to have a knack for something and they'll become your, quote, your super user. And that super user then will take that technology and then you'll, they, you'll use them to train other people. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. But technology is, is a constant changing th animal, um, whether it comes to our fire systems or our nurse call systems <laughs> or telecommunication systems, you name the system, you know, it's changing and evolving. Morale boosting. Um, you know, I put a question mark on this one because training can go both ways. I have seen it go both ways over the years. You would think that universally people want to grow in advance and add skills and so on and so forth. And when I said that, probably some of you might even said, ah, oh, that doesn't sound so good. I hate constant change. And, you know, new skill sets mean new, new responsibilities and new responsibilities means they're just going to work me harder and not pay me more. And, and I, I've heard all that. And, and that's true. Um, there are many times where we feel like, gosh, they're just making me do everybody else's job. I've been through that. I've, I've worn so many hats at any given time or reported to so many people at any given time that it did not improve my morale. I, I was stretched too thin, you know, and, and it was part of it from knowing too much. And sometimes I wished I didn't know as much as I did so I could just have a narrow, nice little job, you know, but um, it can hurt morale sometimes especially when you just don't feel like you have the time. And I think that's the critical piece of it. When people have time and training, I think they feel good about it. I think the morale goes up. They're like, hey, oh good, I can actually take my time while I'm here and I can take my, and it goes faster. I, I think that's a common thread when you hear people who want to continue to train. They like to stay busy because the days go by faster. It just makes work more valuable. So in many cases, it can be morale boosting. I will tell you too, though, there comes a time in a lot of people's career where they just don't want any more training. Um, they literally are done. They're like, you know what? I've learned enough. I don't want to learn anything new. I just want to wind it out. And you have to be prepared for that because that is a that does happen. In those cases, you know, you have to figure out and have a different, uh, you know, toolkit and skill set to say, okay, well, how are we going to do this? Now, if a person's within a year or two of retiring, it's pretty simple usually. But what if they're five or ten years? Then what do you do? That could be a whole new set of challenges. But uh, just to say, training is definitely typically done right, a morale booster, given enough time. But it can also be uh, a negative when it comes to morale. Decreased discipline issues. It kind of goes along um, with all of this, and that is that you know when you are training people and you have a competency based, um, you can catch and nip things earlier. Um, you know, rather than be frustrated that somebody can't seem to do the job on a consistent basis and complain about it year after year after year after year, when you have a competency-based training, it does separate people out. It does really say, hey, look, these people are moving along and growing and they're doing the job and they're, they're, they're becoming better and better and better, whereas here's a person who isn't growing. And so what ends up happening is <clears throat> very often people will self-regulate themselves and say, you know what, I don't fit and I need to move on, and they will move themselves on when they see that happening. It also allows you to have candid conversations with them before they become disciplinary issues. So you'd, again, not just complaining about it, you're actually having intentional conversations and you're helping them you know, strengthen their skill sets and work on their strengths and weaknesses. So, so they don't lead to disciplinary issues. I think very often, you know, when you don't have those intentional training um, you know, things, people will, again, they will react passive or aggressively and it becomes, um, you know, disciplinary issues because you're just like, okay, that person is just being a bad employee. Well, sometimes that's true, but in most cases, it's because no one has really helped develop them. Um, and I have seen both sides of that. So neither one is always true. But in any case, having an intentional competency-based training program can often minimize and decrease disciplinary issues. Some of the key characteristics, and this is really kind of the, the, the tools, if you will, uh, a little bit more of, of, of COPSI-based training. Cooperation, that's something that I started using years ago. And when it comes to COPSI-based training, you want to create an environment where people are not afraid to share their skills with each other. In fact, you want an environment where people really want to make the other people in, this, in, the, in the environment better than they are on a kind of a continuum and everyone will improve. And I've used a number of examples. I probably have used them in even courses here. You know, cooperation really is competing to cooperate. You know, I, I, I put it in terms of, if you were to play basketball with a four-year-old, you could play with one finger and probably dominate. 
you know, um, if you were to play uh, basketball with somebody who was equal to your gift, your talent, you know, you'd have to work at it, you know, pretty consistently. If you play somebody who is better than you, then you're going to have to work a little harder to keep compete and keep up. And it's going to make you improve on what you do. And so my point is, is that if you are creating an environment where others, you're helping others to get better, it will automatically help you get better. And that's really kind of, it's happening to me as I go through this program. You know, as I help you train you all, it's helping me because I'm learning along with you. And I'm learning more and more and more. As you get better, you know, I'm getting better at what I'm doing. And so cooperation really is one of the elements you want to introduce and you want to stress is that we're not here to be the smartest person in the room. We're here to really make each other as best as each other can be. And I think that's an admirable quality just personally to have is to try to help others be better. Being journey minded. Again, this kind of ties with that. You know, this is not something that someone is going to necessarily, they're not going to get the skills necessarily overnight. And they, again, in some cases, they may never get the skill. And that really speaks to the journey. You know, we don't know where we're going to be tomorrow, let alone 20 years from now. Um, if you would have told me I would have been teaching out of a college in Owensboro, Kentucky, HFL program in healthcare 20 years ago, I, I, I wouldn't have believed you. I really would not have believed you. I did not see this path. Um, and I could tell you a number of other things in between there and then that I would not have believed because things evolved. The journey sort of, you know, you kind of, it kind of went just a certain way. And, um, you know, I, who knows where I'm going to be, you know, five years from now, you know, am I going to continue to be in academia? I can see it, but, uh, could it change? Absolutely. It could change. So for me, it is a journey. And I think that's a critical understanding that you want to communicate to your staff is the journey mindedness of competency based training. It's going to lead you somewhere. We don't necessarily always know where it's going to lead us. Identify strengths and weaknesses. You know, key care, when you do competency-based training, you truly do start to understand people's strengths and weaknesses. Um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, that's not a bad thing. And it kind of goes along with the journey-mindedness. It goes along with the cooperation. And that is, I think that one of the one of the issues we have with we're afraid to show weakness sometimes. I, 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 we're pretty easy at showing our strengths. I think that comes natural. I said, but weaknesses is a tough one. But, um, but, but to me, as a professional, as a professional, professionals are always working on their weaknesses. Um, they don't spend as much time working on their strengths. Because when you're a pro, even on bad days, you got to play at a high level. And I like to think of that in, in terms of what we do as well. You know, you got to learn to work on your weaknesses. We'll talk about this uh, some more, particularly in one of the capstones. But you really got to work out on your weaknesses and you got to get if you can get your staff to think the same way and, and allow and none of us like to be vulnerable. Probably one of my, one of my issues is, is being vulnerable. I mean, I, I, I try to be good enough so people can't, you know, so people don't, you know, you're not criticized, if you will. And you want to be in, in, in front of things. But weaknesses, we all have them. And creating an environment where it's OK to discuss and develop weaknesses and knowing that it's going to take time to develop them is important because too many times we we, sh we, we we shelter them or we protect them or in some cases uh, they can be trigger points um, for us to cause negative interactions with people when 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 those weaknesses are exposed or someone you know points them out and this is one of those things where you got to be very careful as a leader to protect someone's weaknesses I mean when they have them um, again in most cases uh, the weaknesses that we're talking about are the ones that, 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 the, that the employee is, is intentionally wanting to develop. You're talking about it and you're creating a plan for it and giving tools for it and they're working and you see them working. And I think that's a key piece. When you see people actively working on it, that is so, so important. But when you're seeing folks, even under those circumstances, again, that are either passively or intentionally or aggressively not working on it, that's when usually the, the, the tension begins. And if you can create a culture and environment where people can work on weaknesses, uh, you have done something remarkable in the culture of those that you're leading. The next one I have is show me. And I think of the, you know, say, you know Missouri and the show me state. 
competencies is about showing it it, again it kind of goes back to the weaknesses and strength thing and that is you people have to demonstrate they have to be able to say yeah i can do it and i can show you i can do it um you know i i'm reminded of years ago uh, one of the technologies i worked on was uh, interaortic balloon pumps Uh, they're very sophisticated devices and to me it was mind-boggling and somewhat scary what they did you know they would insert a a balloon up the either the brachial or femoral artery typically the femoral artery in the leg and they would take it and they would take it all the way up to just outside the chambers of the heart and then this balloon would synchronize itself with the heart the qrs waveform and it would synchronize itself in such a way it, what it would do is called it would perfuse or it would help to enhance blood flow back to the coronary arteries, which are the arteries that feed the heart. So this was for folks who had weak coronary arteries or they had some kind of restriction in the coronary arteries and wanted to strengthen their coronary arteries to strengthen the muscles of their heart. And what it would do is it would time itself where it would open right after the aorta pushed blood out of the heart. It would open just towards the tail end of it so that what would happen is it would block the valve of the aortic valve would close the balloon would open and it would cause a back pressure not enough to force the aortic valve to open or force it in just enough for it to force pressure back to the arteries feeding you know the the arteries to the coronary arteries to the heart and it was very, very critical timing. I mean, you had to make sure things were happening just right. And you had to synchronize it using an oscilloscope where you got these the readings of the, the heart, you got the timing of the, um, the balloon, and you would use a simulator and you would sit there and you would sync these things to the thing and you would calibrate it and ensure its calibration was dead on, you know, to the right moment consistently. and. It was a little bit involved in doing it. I mean, using the oscilloscope was not something that was, you know, universally understood by everybody. And I was trained at it and I could do it. And I had to train others who went to training. And then I wanted to make sure that they, because we we only did this uh, preventive maintenance like once a year or twice a year. And so I would do competency-based training because of the risk of the equipment. And and candidly, uh, when I would have the technician, it would be just me and the technician, and I would say, okay, show me you can do it. They would look at me initially and go, oh, I can do it. No problem. This is an oscilloscope. I said, okay, great. Then they just show me. And I could see, I could read the body language. The body language was uncertainty. And and I would just say, okay, well, no problem. Let's, let's walk through it. And this was really, and I'm going to skip for a second. This is kind of leading to train the trainer or, or, or see one, do one, show one. You know, it would be like, okay, well, let's go ahead and let me let me do it for you. Let me show you how it's done. Now, now you do one, and then typically it was you show me is what it was that you can do it. But I can't begin to tell you that um, that this it consistently, you know, the individuals I worked with initially could not do it. They could not show me, and then when they did, they were unsuccessful. So it is so very very important for people to be willing to be vulnerable and to show you, or just hopefully admit they can't do it. Or if they can't do it, be open to, if you will, the training to learn how to do it. And I think we all can take lessons from that. Um, Because there's one thing that we've learned throughout the HFL courses that you don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot that we don't know that we don't know. And that's a larger part of what there is to know. So we have a lot to learn, all of us. So we want to create that environment. Um, again, you want to be able to have the show me attitude where people are willing to show you they can do it. And then train the trainer. Um, you know, really, you want to be able to have folks who have been trained and they're willing to train others. Uh, I think it's a very effective way because when someone has gone through training, they know what it's like to, to, to be new at something and they kind of know some of the questions. Whereas somebody who's done something for a long, long, long time um, is is you know they sometimes forget what it's like to be new so it's key that you have people who understand training who are educator minded or who have done it fresh enough that they can train someone else and they can also you know understand what that trainers what that trainee is going through i already talked about see one do one show one that's kind of a doctor's thing over historically you know that's the way you know how do, how do people learn to do all these surgeries well that's it you're going to see one do one show one now with 
you know, the evolution of technology and, and 3D, you know, um, uh, technology and things like that, they can actually do it in simulators. But, you know, really still pervasively, it's got to be see one, do one, show one. And this last point, really one of the key points I wanted to make, and that is you've got to make sure you work in very small groups. I mean, the more critical the training, the more that a person is going to be left to have to do it by themselves, you know, after the, the training goes away, the more you're going to want to have the group to be very, very small. I have found that if you have a large group of people in a room and they're being trained on a critical thing, that what happens is sort of group or herd mentality takes over and, and people don't ask questions. People don't want to look vulnerable. Um, the trainer does all the touching of the equipment. Um, the people who are being trained don't touch it. And they all then at the end of the day, they sign off that they, they know how to do it. And that's really very, very, very ineffective and poor training. Um, you know, and you need to be able to distinguish when that is okay to do, which is not very often, and when that's not okay to do. Um, typically, if you're going to have any kind of training that involves touching something, it's not just head knowledge, but touching something, you're really going to want to have a small group, a one-on-one -on -one Ideally, what I have seen works best is the trainers working with two people because another person will typically be pretty very vulnerable with the other person if there's just two people. And the trainer can do sort of the, the, see, the see one, do one, show one pretty effectively. You know, the trainer will, will show them how to do it. He'll say, which one of you want to do it first? They'll do it, and that person then will talk it through with the other person, and they'll reverse roles. And I think that's probably the most effective way I think of training, it builds a little camaraderie, um, you know, gives a little more perspective in case somebody sees something differently or something like that other than the trainer. And I think, again, it works really, really well. But, but really, you really want these small groups. And that's, if I, if I, you know, if you go out there from HFL and I know that one of my graduates is doing core competency-based training in groups, um, you know, I, I, I'll probably do what I can to revoke your, your, your uh, degree. I mean, I'm kidding, of course, but that's how critical, that's how strongly I feel about this because we need this level of competency in healthcare that we know that when we're not around uh, in the 24, 365, you know, 24 by 7, 365 environment, that the job is being done safely and effectively. So th that's, that's the last key characteristic that I wanted to share with you. Um, so in, in summary, and I kind of hit it, I, I, I tend to do that, I tend to hit my summaries at the end of my <laughs> last slide, but I just want to put the summary slide here to make the point that competency-based training is one of those really important pieces, and it's really more of a culture, and it's a mindset, and that's what I really hope to pass along to you in this roughly 40-minute uh, lecture, is that you take that mindset and you develop that culture and that you systemically and intentionally apply it. Now, I didn't, I don't know if I talked about this at great length. I'll briefly talk about it now, but you can't train everybody on everything. We get that. And even when someone has core and general competencies, you can't go through all of them every year. But what you really want to do is you want to create the, bring the uh, intelligence to your, your training that you know and you have to have a sense of what's called selected competencies you know what you need to do is say okay over three to five years you know i will train everybody on everything that's part of what they need to know over three to five years however every year or every three months or every six months or something like that we're going to train on this because it's that critical it's something that we don't do very often and it's something that people just have to know and be able to respond to on a moment's notice. So you really need to bring sort of a, a, a real critical thinking to your, your all, everything you look at. When you look at all these training that people need, what do they need to have, you know, once every three to five years? What can they have every year? And what are the ones, the few, that they need to have more regularly? And so that's really what I'll leave you with. I hope this uh, uh, galvanizes and makes a lot of sense for you. And uh, going forward, you know, you're going to build on this. And, and again, the theme, in the, in the uh, theme of cooperation, you're going to take this to another level that I could never even um, begin to, to be able to do myself.